Warm welcome. We'll be starting in uh, four minutes and 30 seconds, as you can see, the opening ceremony of the Teach to Reach Accelerator Conference. I'm Rida Sadki, uh, your host from the Geneva Learning Foundation. A warm welcome wherever you may be, uh, whether it is morning, afternoon or evening. Uh, very pleased to have you uh, joining this uh, conference and looking forward to hearing your voices. Uh, with me in the room are um, members of the Teach to Reach organizing committee. So you'll be hearing their voices. They will be speaking and engaging with the three global leaders. So um, Violaine Mitchell from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, Kate O'Brien, who leads the, uh, uh, the uh, Department of Vaccination at the World Health Organization, and Anurada Gupta from uh, Gavi, the Vaccine Alliance. So we'll be hearing from these three global leaders and speaking back to them, uh, engaging in hopefully the beginning of a new kind of dialogue between immunization staff, immunization leaders from all parts of the system, from the health facility to the district, to the region or state, to the capital city, to the central uh, planning team, um, to the regional and global levels. We have everyone here with us uh, during Teach to Reach and it is a unique occasion just at the right moment when um, 50 countries have already started and every other country in the world is preparing a COVID-19 vaccine introduction. So. Thank you so much for joining us. If um, uh, yes, uh, in three minutes we'll be opening the uh, uh, ceremony to uh, launch uh, the Teach to Reach Accelerator Conference, and then right after that uh, we'll be going into the uh, uh, the sessions. Of course, I want to uh, greet uh, some of those those of you who have uh, chosen to follow um, uh, to follow this plenary on. Um, uh, on YouTube or LinkedIn or Facebook or Twitter. We're live streaming the only the plenaries uh, on all these platforms. So hello to Ruth Olote from Accra and Rosa Jambo, um, who is also following. Please tell us what city and country you're from. Uh, Christine from Kenya, uh, hello to you. Uh, Juliana Wuma, uh, Abdul Rahman uh, Hudu, who says good afternoon. He does communication for development on uh, polio in Abuja, Nigeria. It's great to be here. He says it's great to have you here and to have you with us, Abdul Rahman. Uh, together with uh, right now, there are 388. <laughs> the numbers are going up uh, on the uh, uh, on the platform. We had this morning uh, over 750 people uh, together simultaneously for the uh, uh, for the opening uh, plenary of the francophones. So. Th that's um, we've got one minute uh, thirty uh, seconds uh, left on the clock. Uh, looking forward to this uh, session, and I hope you are feeling the uh, uh, the excitement. We're finally here um, to the Teach to Reach Accelerator Conference. Today is the 26th of January, 2021. I'm Reda Sadki from the Geneva Learning Foundation and a warm welcome to you, uh, to all those of you who are watching in the uh, plenary of the uh, conference. I see many, many messages already. 
uh, to those of you who are watching us on uh, Facebook, LinkedIn, um, Twitter, or uh, YouTube, a warm welcome uh, to you on the occasion of this uh, conference. As you can see, let's uh, say hello to a few of the folks who are uh, watching. So um, Jemima from Ghana. Uh, Jemima Tornu, welcome to you. I hope you're also able to access the conference because only the plenary is actually going to be uh, live streamed. So after that, you'll have to join the conference to participate in the sessions. We've got some great sessions. Just finished the Francophone session with uh, that had 1,600 and some uh, participants uh, throughout the, uh, the morning and 750 in the plenary. Uh, thank you, Dr. Murtaza, uh, for the kind words. Uh, Julian Awuma is connecting from Cameroon. Subhendu Ray, excited for the inauguration, um, calling in from WHO India. Uh, everyone excited to be here today, Brima Barrow. I think that is the general uh, feeling. Atahir Abubakar says, a memorable event is taking place. Happy to be a part. Good afternoon to everyone from Ghana, says Adutwum uh, Richard. Uh, Mohamed Abubakar. Uh, from Nigeria. Ibrima is following from Gambia. Uh, so excited, says Maria Fernanda Monzon, and she is actually calling in from Argentina. It says, great days ahead of us. Uh, Atahir says, uh, finally, we're here. Congratulations to all. And yes, Atahir is one of the 282 members of the organizing committee. Um, thank you for the kind words about the, uh, the music as well. So let's get down to business. Uh, together with me in the room are members of the organizing committee who have put to put Teach to Reach together for you, as well as uh, members of the uh, uh, team team leaders who are leading the teams, the informal groupings of alumni of programs of the Geneva Learning Foundation, some of them done in partnership with WHO, others uh, such as Teach to Reach done uh, in close, working in close collaboration uh, with uh, many, many global partners. Um, with us is... Um, uh, Professor Felicity Cutts. So just um, about a year ago, uh, we invited her to join the International Advisory Board of um, Teach to Reach as we were getting ready to launch the program and looking to her combination of uh, research, um, practice, field experience, uh, and have really valued and treasured the advice uh, and support that she's uh, provided over the last year. Uh, Felicity, could I ask you, could I invite you to uh, turn on your <laughs> webcam? Of course, this was not planned, <laughs> but uh, very pleased that you're here and uh, hoping that you would be able to stay, uh, share uh, what are your thoughts as uh, this gathering is bringing together uh, more than 6,200 uh, participants. Uh, thanks, Reda, and uh, hello, everyone. Greetings uh, around the world. Uh, this is in, it's an incredible occasion, and I'm very pleased to be able to join even for brief moments from time to time. I'm unfortunately I won't be able to participate in all of it. But uh, the last year has been challenging for the whole world, and uh, Geneva Learning Foundation and the Teach to Reach program have... Um, shown how, uh, how resilient people can be, how motivated people are in, uh, in different countries, in different settings. Um, we in the North, we might like to complain and moan about being in lockdown and having to forego a trip to the restaurant. And you out there are actually on the front line in all sorts of difficult conditions and just really showing us the best, the very best of humanity. And um, it's just a, a privilege to, to listen to you from time to time and just see what wonderful work you're doing and, and how much sacrifice you're making. Um, the other thing about this conference is to have an organizing committee uh, so big, but also so diverse. And for once, for a, a conference to be organized truly from the bottom up, um, it, it's fantastic. So I think everyone will learn an immense amount from the discussions, but also the process and moving on from all the friendships that uh, people involved in Teach to Reach and indeed in other scholar programs um, uh, are forging. So I wish everyone the very best and I have nothing but admiration for you all. Thanks. Thank you, uh, Professor uh, Felicity Cutts. Now, um, just a note, if you have any problems getting into the conference, you can always watch the plenary on LinkedIn, YouTube, Twitter, Facebook. Some of you might prefer to see it there, but I see there's quite a lively discussion already happening. So let's, um, let's dive in. Um, so first of all, um, 
Felicity Cuts is one of the members of the International Advisory Board that has helped us get to this uh, to this point. When we asked you at the beginning of Teacher Reach in March 2020, what is most needed to improve immunization program performance? And 45% of you for the Anglophone said leadership. All right. And that is why leadership is such a big part of this Teach to Reach conference. Uh, what is the most significant performance gap in your country? It is strategies to reach. That is what you told us. Uh, so a lot of what we've built through this conference, working with the organizing committee, supporting the organizing committee, uh, has to do with uh, uh, with those two things that we first saw observed in a sam- fairly you know, sample of more than 3,000 participants who signed up for uh, Teach to Reach. So now what about this uh, conference. So we need some music there too, because if we were in a room, we would be making noise together. There's 6,257 immunization professionals who registered. Uh, more than three, almost 3,300 Anglophones. We might have, this was from this morning. Now, 3,078 of those have actually uh, just, um, just uh, managed to get uh, tickets. <laughs> so um, together, we're more than, again, have broken through the ceiling of 3,000 participants who actually made it to the conference. I speak to the digital divide, speak to the challenges of the daily work and the, the challenges that you're facing every day, why we cannot be greater in number, but 3,000 is already pretty incredible. In terms of involvement in immunization training, you, uh, you can see, let me start from the bottom. There's a few people who fund training. One in five who evaluate it, almost a quarter who develop training, half of you facilitate it, and more than half of you participate in trainings. That's surprisingly low, a low number because I think in immunization, everyone uh, participates in uh, trainings. Now here you can see when we asked you, what's the most important thing for you to gain from the conference? Almost a third of you said, this is, for me is about preparing for COVID-19 vaccine introduction. Now, who are we exactly? Where are we from is an important part of the uh, answer to that. And you can see here 94 countries with Anglophone participants, 120 countries or more uh, altogether. And here is the countries by number, listed by number of participants. So the countries with that have sent the largest delegations are Nigeria, Ghana, India, Kenya, Pakistan, Ethiopia, Cameroon. And I'd like to say, if you are the sole representative, or if there are two or three or four or five of you, you can be proud that you've made it to this conference, and we hope it will be useful to you, and that you'll be able to connect with um, participants from wherever they may be from across the world, and get us bring as much back to your country, even if you are the sole representative. As you can see, there's quite a long tail there. Um, where do people come from? You can see here that overwhelmingly, the participants in the Teach to Reach conference are from the so-called sub-national level, but we know that's also the operational level. That's the level where things happen. Most of the participants are men, but <laughs> yes, uh, we believe and advocate for gender equality in this conference, and we'd like to ask for your help in making sure next year, uh, if there is a second Teach to Reach conference, that we will achieve parity there. Now, in terms of organizational affiliation, you can see that almost half are from the Ministry of Health, but you can also see uh, that uh, NGOs have a very strong present in the, uh, presence in the conference. Students, um, whether they're nursing students, medical students, public health students, uh, are also an important part. And very happy to see that there's a, a, a significant number of WHO country office staff who have joined the uh, uh, the conference. Now, this conference is generating a lot of data. If you for the for the um, uh, 4,317 who uh, uh, completed the registration questionnaire for the conference, we asked you some critical questions, questions we think are as critical. And during the conference, in the different sessions, and in plenary, we'll be answering these. We'll be sharing what you told us about leadership for learning, uh, what you told us about learning in the pandemic, what steps, how you've adapted training and supervision during the pandemic, um, what you told us about the success stories, the lessons learned, the failures, uh, everything that you yes, uh, you might have had to share around learning innovation. And then on uh, COVID-19 vaccine introduction, um, Yes, uh, let me just fix the uh, <laughs> the French. Okay, so this one is still in French, but um, 
you, uh, we asked you, you know, how are you doing with training and country preparedness? Uh, more data that we'll be sharing and really preliminary results from the Pulse uh, survey that we did with input from the World Health Organization, and that's going to be discussed in a session at 4 p.m. Um, is, you know, is about what we're calling the, the COVID-19 um, Peer Hub Pulse. And there we got 2,274 responses, uh, again, half and half between uh, Francophones and, uh, and Anglophones. So that is... Um, what we've got so far, just to give you a quick overview of what's going to happen after this plenary, because I think we'll, we're probably going to run out of time. Um, you're going to go to the reception. You can see right now, you can always see what's live now, what's happening now. Scroll down, scroll down past the partners and sponsors, and you can see instantly what is actually being featured, what is actually happening here. So you can see right now it's the opening ceremony and orientation at the 45 minute mark, those of you who want to go and network will be able to go to the networking uh, session here. And um, then at 4 p.m. Geneva, so uh, you know, 49 minutes from now, we'll be going into a number of sessions and you will have to make a choice. Which sessions are you going to attend? You can only attend one at a time. So will you go into building capacity for HSS with Katya from Gavi? Will you go into the immunization agenda with Anne Lindstrand, who leads the uh, uh, COVAX pillar for WHO? Or will you go into the uh, COVID-19 peer hub session looking at some of the data I've just uh, described? So that is the first session. And then at 5 p.m., um, we go into learning innovation in practice, accelerating problem-solving capabilities, so you can view this program at any time. Now, what are we actually going to do um, in the plenary? We have three uh, distinguished uh, guests. So they are um, on my left, uh, um, Kate O'Brien, uh, who leads the um, immunization department at um, the World Health Organization headquarters. In the middle, um, Anurada Gupta, uh, Deputy Chief Executive Officer of uh, Agavi, the Vaccine Alliance, and Violan Mitchell. So we're going to uh, listen to um, what they had to say when Charlotte, Ja, and I uh, spoke to them about the Teach to Reach conference. And then we'll come back and we'll hear from members of the organizing committee to hear um, what members of the organizing committee would like to, to, to say back to these global leaders, hoping to uh, invent, you know, create a new kind of dialogue uh, through this uh, conference. So to start us off, uh, please welcome Kate O'Brien uh, from the uh, Department of First Vaccination. First of all, um, it's not just that countries are getting ready to introduce COVID-19 vaccines. Um, we're in country introduction now. So there are 50 countries that have introduced COVID vaccines and we are going to rapidly be going to, um, uh, we hope every single country having introduced vaccine in the next few months. Um, so the, one, of the, one of the things that I think is really um, surprising about this event um, and really in a very, very optimistic way is this is basically about crowdsourcing um, people who want to know, people who are uh, wanting to learn, wanting to be leaders. Um, and this is exactly where the energy and the initiative and that, that sort of thrust that we need um, in order to be successful on the COVID vaccines and frankly on all vaccines is going to come from. It's from that motivated group of people. It's all of you um, who are saying, I, I, I want to be in this space of um, being ready uh, and and having all the tools at hand to know what we should be doing and how we're going to get there and what can I actually contribute to this. It's, it's, it's the lessons and learning that is coming from people who are working in the community because that's where vaccination actually happens. Thank you so much, uh, Kate O'Brien from uh, WHO. Now, our first, uh, second question is uh, from uh, Charlotte M. Boo. Uh, Charlotte? Global partners have recently expressed concern about the effectiveness of current immunization training and learning methods, yet every uh, immunization program requires that capacities be strengthened, uh, performance improved, and leadership developed. My questions for you, Kate, are what then is the role of global leaders to advocate and support effective learning? Beyond refusing to fund what has been funded in the past, what is the strategy to develop the next generation of leaders? You know the uh, the sort of framework for immunization training and the 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 responses from global partners about the concerns they have on effectiveness of uh, immunization training and learning methods is is well founded. Um, that's not to say that 
people don't get anything out of those kinds of learning environments. But I think the measurements have been um, very little is retained and very little of it actually goes into practice. And that's the purpose, of course, of training is to make sure that our practice and our impact for what we're doing is stronger than it was before we trained. It's not only how we train, it's about also what we define leadership to be. And there is a leadership role for everybody in the system. And that really is, I think, the the sort of second concept about training leaders is where does that leadership come from? Um, And recognizing that that really has to be at the most local level than the most provincial state level across all organizations that leadership is not um, strictly defined as a sort of hierarchy in a structure. It's a, I think leadership is much more about our own individual leadership of taking charge and being responsible for the, for the things that we're driving forward. Thank you, Kate O'Brien, um, for the first part of the interview uh, for the Teach to Reach Accelerator Conference. Um, the next question is going to come from Min Jha from the Geneva Learning Foundation, who has a question for you about the need to teach critical thinking, adaptation, and leading change at all levels. Ja? Thank you, Rita, and thank you, Kate. My question is um, closely related to what you just said, actually. So in the COVID-19 peer hub, more than 700 participants developed context-specific action plans to keep immunization services going in their own context. Um, uh, Francois Gass, who coached participants four times per week during those exercises, he observed that many from the district and the health facilities levels we're probably doing action planning for the first time. Current API configuration follows really a top-down management pra- a practice. The national team plans, and then the plan is carried out in the district. This may have been very effective in the past. However, we have found that this misses the need for adapting plans and figuring out exactly how to execute them. And this also requires analytical and critical thinking skills, as well as skills to make progress within complex organizational setups. It's even more critical when it comes to urban inequity, zero-dose communities, or COVID-19 vaccine introduction. Yet training is also top-down, and people from the so-called lower levels usually receive at best, as you said, cascade training or some kind of e-learning that gives them information, but not skills. So my question to you, Kate, is what is the relationship between empowered subnational staff and greater greater critical thinking and adaptation? How does your organization see the role of learning and leadership in this context? So uh, this, I I just love this question um, because it really hits the nail on the head uh, that we really think that um, where we need to be focusing is at the most local level of the immunization program. That is where this critical thinking is needed, the adaptation, the leading change at that level. Because um, although we can provide information, um, and, and you really emphasize that training in the past has been very much about information sharing, and then an expectation that that information would be deployed, not only cascaded, but would be deployed. But we can't, we can't, Um, train for every scenario of everything that's going to happen in an immunization program. So there are for sure, you know, points of information that are important and needed, but what's really going to deploy and deliver the impact of vaccine programs in ways that we haven't seen before, especially in these hard to reach um, settings or in communities where there is mistrust um, or in communities that are mobile and communities that are really dynamic is that the program itself, and, the, and that means people, it's the, the program doesn't exist without the people, but the people who are working in the program at that most local level have to be able to adapt, to be agile, to innovate things that will work in that particular setting with those leaders in the community, with those families, with that, um, that uh, living circumstance. Thank you, uh, Kate O'Brien. Uh, we've got three questions left uh, for this uh, for this plenary uh, interview, and the next one builds on what uh, a lot of what you've been sharing and and. Uh, um 
During Teach to Reach, during the Teach to Reach program in 2020, we worked with more than 3,000 country-based immunization staff. And to be honest, we found that many staff had little or no knowledge of even the basic instructional design principles for how to develop effective training. However, we also found that they made up for this through remarkable creativity invention, uh, relying on what they know that no one else does about their context, that indigenous knowledge and expertise, and using that to solve problems and to figure out how to achieve the training objectives and to learn to do new things in new ways. In fact, it sometimes felt as though if training works at all, it's actually due to the exceptional dedication and leadership of such staff. So how does your organization currently capture that field-based learning, that local expertise, and apply it to strengthen the support that your organization then supports back to countries? Of course, we're talking about double-loop learning. Yeah, so, um, you know, learning is an iterative um, an iterative entity. Um, it's, a, it's really about um, implementing something, seeing whether it works, adapting it to fix the things that didn't work and then turning the wheel on that again seeing if that works um, measuring so there are a couple of things I, I really want to focus on um, in your question here the first is you have to know what works and what doesn't work and that is an ongoing real-time quality improvement um, process and so the you know that what's really relevant here is that um, the capacity of staff, to actually collect information. It could be quantitative information, it could be qualitative information, but to do it in a way um, that is a bit more systematic than, um, than anecdotes of, of something that happened or didn't happen. So I think one of the elements here is also, as we think about training, learning, and uh, leadership, um, that focusing on the idea that, that there is a constant iterative loop that we go through um, to pull in information about what's working, solution around how to fix the issues that are broken or are not ideal, not optimal, deploy them, and then learn again. So I think that's really um, one, of the, one of the key sort of elements here, and you referred to sort of the, you know, the double loop of, uh, of learning. Thank you, uh, Kate O'Brien uh, from the World Health Organization. Uh, we are at the Teach to Reach Accelerator Conference, and opening uh, this uh, three-day event. Today we have, in fact, the key question um, that is going to come from Charlotte and Boo about learning leadership and the role of global partners. Charlotte? In October 2020, 549 alumni of the Teach to Reach program created a Global Council of Learning Leaders for Immunization. This is a voluntary group bringing together people from all countries and levels of the system. At the Teach to Reach conference, the founders will map out their vision for how to lead change and call on others to join them. So I would like to find out from you, Kate, will you be listening? Uh, what do you think is the potential of such a diverse voluntary group? Should such bottom-up initiative and leadership be supported by global immunization partners? What will condition your response? Well, will I be listening? Um, you bet I'll be listening. There are two words in there that are uh, that really resonate. The first is that it's a voluntary group. So by definition, um, this is a group of people who are engaged, who want uh, to have an impact, who are committing their own personal time in a voluntary way to participate. And there's nobody more valuable um, in terms of voice, in terms of experience, um, than people who are volunteering their time because it, it fundamentally shows um, their commitment to what they're doing. The other word is diverse. Um, and I think what uh, goes without saying, but it is important to say, and therefore I will say it, is that talent comes from anywhere and everywhere. And diversity means we're drawing on the best range of talent possible anywhere in the world and everywhere in the world. When we start, when we don't have diversity, we are shutting off um, lines of experience that are real lines of experience for communities, families, people um, that make a real difference. We're talking with 
Dr. Kate O'Brien, uh, Director of Immunization Vaccines and Biologicals at the World Health Organization. We have um, saved, uh, I don't know, I can't say the best for last, but our final question is uh, the elephant in the room, the uh, COVID-19 vaccine. So vaccine manufacturing facilities, there's been a lot of investment, obviously, in manufacturing specifically for COVID vaccine to rapidly get the capability, build up the capabilities needed to successfully introduce uh, vaccines. Now, Anna Patrick, uh, writing about Ebola response in The Lancet uh, a long, long time ago in February 2015, said, building new treatment centers was an easy task, she says, next to training and supervising people to staff them. The primary lesson so far has not been about the need for new response methods, but about human resources and coordination. So here are my questions for you, uh, Kate O'Brien. Um, can the conventional methods and strategies for teaching and learning and immunization get the job done? You've already answered that several times, but it'd be good to hear that reiterated side by side with the commensurate investments in vaccine manufacturing you know, facilities. Uh, is there is it lopsided or not? Um, and when it comes to getting enough ready, enough people ready at speed and scale to introduce COVID-19 vaccine, what does that look like? What are global partners trying to do differently to support countries to get ready? And how is your organization supporting that innovative development by countries of people capabilities for COVID-19 vaccine introduction, given the scape, the scope, the scale, and the complexity of the challenge. Yeah, having COVID vaccines, um, uh, a good analogy was made by somebody that having COVID vaccines um, is like getting to the base camp of Mount Everest, but actually vaccinating people and vaccinating people in the scale and dimension that, that uh, needs to happen in order to, um, you know, crush this pandemic uh, is really the task of getting to the peak of, of Everest. Um, the, in order for that to happen, what's really clear is it's not business as usual. We don't have enough people in any country around the world to be um, deploying the vaccines that are um, already starting to be deployed and are, are at our doorstep uh, for, for many countries. Um, there aren't enough people who work in the immunization program if we're only going to lean on people in the immunization program to actually deploy these vaccines. We have to pull out all the stops for how to get these vaccines as quickly as possible to as many people as possible in the priority that they're needed. And so what that really means um, to be at speed scale to introduce um, is we have to do some things differently here. We have to be able to train people quickly and train them in the essential things. That's not going to happen if we stick with our usual training methods. Um, so what the Teach to Reach program um, is, is really um, critical for is really diversifying our way of thinking about how we train, um, how we assure that people have ongoing engagement in training, that they have ongoing development of capabilities for COVID-19 vaccines. And what we've seen in COVID-19 is if you are flat-footed in this pandemic, you, you're already, um, you know, uh, you've already kind of lost the game on this. For COVID-19 vaccines, this is going to be extremely dynamic. And we are seeing that in, in high-income countries, especially already, that if you have designed a program, and that's the only way that you can deliver the program, Apologies, we have a small uh, technical difficulty with uh, Kate O'Brien's... Uh First of all, um, it's not stick with our usual training. That's not going to work. Everybody in this enterprise has got to be able to scale, has got to be able to deal with complexity, has got to be able to do personal, local innovation to actually overcome the challenges. But doing that in the context of some pretty technical specifications to assure that the vaccines are getting where they need to be into the arms of people and doing so with the protection of the vaccines themselves. Thank you. That's uh, Kate O'Brien, Director of the uh, Immunization of Vaccines and Biologicals Department. I'd like to go um, now to Amel Altahir, uh, who is a member of the Teach to Reach Organizing Committee. Um, Amel, are you able to, uh, yes, unmute yourself? I'm trying to find you. Um, and are you able to turn on your webcam as well? Let's, uh, let's start by hearing from you first. 
Yes, I mean, what are you? Please introduce yourself and then we will. Uh, yes, and let me get you uh, up on the screen. Yeah. Sure. Uh, my name is Amel. I'm from Sudan. I'm working with WHO as International Technical Officer since last seven years. So I have been working in three or four different countries. Currently, I'm based to support Pakistan, uh, the polio program, since last five or five uh, years. So my, and I'm very honored to be given a chance to talk today. Uh, my, my, my only one, one comment or suggestion, because I'm part of T2 REIT certificate one, and then I came to two and Birha. Now looking into WHO, because I'm part of WHO and dealing with many of the staff at health facility level and community level. Now uh, looking into the number of participants and what I get personally from the training, how do I improve myself, I improved how to deliver really quality training. If there is any plan from WHO, web, uh, from WHO side or other NGOs to really utilize T to reach program as best to improve the capacity building of the workers, because I'm speaking now uh, as part of Pakistan, one of the issues we are really having now, the quality of the training we have been giving is really is usual, and it is boring, and when you do the assessment, the outcome is not like what we are planning. So my really suggestion, if we can utilize this to reach program as base for that. Thank you, Rida. Thank you, uh, Amel. And um, of course, we the interview is pre-recorded. Um, I'm sure Kate would have loved to, uh, <laughs> you know, to, to to answer that and to follow up. Um, we're going next uh, to hear from uh, Anuradha Gupta. So she is the deputy uh, chief executive at Gavi, the Vaccine Alliance. Um, her um, uh, the excerpt from her interview is uh, just five minutes, and then we'll come back to the organizing committee. And we are looking at your comments uh, in the for those of you who are in the plenary. Um, we are there's some very good comments coming in so I hope we'll have time to uh, to go to them as well here is Anuradha Gupta so thank you and I would begin by saying that I'm so excited uh, to be able to speak to you all I truly applaud the idea behind this conference as health workers are our strongest pillar uh, and I genuinely believe that investing in innovative ways to upskill health workforce is so critical to reaching every child with immunization. For vaccination to happen, uh, three V's uh, must come together. Vaccine, vaccinator, and vaccine. The vaccines has expanded over the years uh, from protecting against six infectious diseases uh, in 2001 to 18 uh, today, including uh, COVID uh, uh, vaccines. And these different vaccines, as you know, require new skills, uh, uh, such as intradermal administration, fractional dose, uh, uh, such as IPV, uh, including skills in administering multiple uh, vaccines per session. Health workers need to be trained to understand the different characteristics of vaccines, assure caregivers of their benefits, respond to questions, observe adverse events, and provide relevant information on symptoms that may appear. And I really believe that health worker skills are not just confined to administering the vaccine, but also higher order interpersonal skills are generating confidence in vaccines. Health workers' attitudes uh, play a big role uh, in ensuring uh, that caregivers uh, bring their children back for the full course of vaccination and we know that stigmatization, rude, discourteous behaviors all play a part in reducing demand for subsequent doses, resulting in dropout of children. Given their strong connection with the community, uh, vaccinators need to be equipped with, with the right information uh, to dispel common myths and rumors and create trust with caregivers. This is especially important given the mounti mounting vaccine hesitancy that we witness uh, today. And finally, the health workforce must be equipped to identify those who are either zero dose 
not having received even a single dose of DTP vaccine or under immunized and are therefore bereft of the full course of essential vaccines and also analyze barriers that prevent access and help surmount them successfully. So I would only say that COVID has highlighted more than ever before that you are our first line of defense. I salute the work uh, you do and, and really urge you to get this whole community uh, to embark on a quest for knowledge and innovation because in an ever-changing world, we are counting on you to ensure we leave no one behind with immunization. Uh, vaccine manufacturing facilities have had to obviously ramp up their capabilities to produce um, the various COVID-19 vaccines. Now, looking back at the Ebola re crisis response way back in 2014, 2015, uh, Anna Patrick, writing in The Lancet, made the statement of building new treatment centers was an easy task. She says, next to training and supervising people to, to staff them. The primary lesson has not been about the need for new response methods, but about human resources and coordination. So the final questions are really, is there commensurate investment in the development of people capabilities and an investment on the same scale and magnitude as there is in manufacturing and then purchasing vaccines. Is there a risk that if there is not that commensurate investment, bad things could happen if uh, people, vaccinators at the end of a chain, but everyone else along that chain uh, doesn't, is not supported at the same level and in you know, very compelling, powerful ways in the same ways that an investment is being made in manufacturing uh, and um, uh, production and purchasing of vaccines. The role that workforce plays uh, is extremely important, as important as, as the vaccines are. But the third and very important uh, link is the vaccinator and the health workforce. So, and if we do not uh, make a commensurate investments in vaccinators of workforce, then clearly we will not be able to see the kind of results that we are hoping for. There are new skills that the health workforce would, uh, would require. And, and therefore, and then we have the new protocols uh, which are imposed by COVID-19 uh, restrictions. So, uh, so really the health, uh, if, if we underinvest in, in health workforce at this uh, point, we would do it at our own peril. So Chika Ofor, uh, you are a member of the organizing uh, committee, and I know you wanted. You are also an, a leader in a non-governmental organization and a leader in civil society. I know you wanted to respond to Anurada Gupta's uh, uh, speech, and also, you know, on behalf of the uh, uh, organizing committee, what would you like to uh, share back w with her? Thank you very much again. Um, um, I just wanted to say that um, COVID-19 um, vaccine now is something that is pretty new to everybody. And for the first time, you're looking at um, vaccines that everybody needs. And all hands must be on deck for any form of immunization to take place. It's not just um, health workers, CSOs, community-based organizations, caregivers. It is when all hands are really on deck that I feel that um, Immunization will be said to be complete because I believe that the numbers will um, come up, you know. So I think also that um, for me, it is um, it will be important to make sure that apart from the caregivers, the vaccinators, and um, the frontline staff, other persons that are outside this, this is the innovation that we're talking about, my own personal opinion, you know. So we're looking for something new to change what is already happening. I think looking outside the box, also will be a way to express this change. And then, you know, NGOs, the private sector, everybody coming together at this point to make it work in terms of knowledge, in terms of knowledge, in terms of actual application from design, design to implementation, for us to be able to make that change, all hands must truly be on deck. You know, everyone, including you, Reda, as you are teaching us. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chika, for, um, for your response to and your, your reflections upon listening to Anurada Gupta. Uh, just keeping an eye on the time, I think it is time for a round of applause uh, for the, um, our speakers. We haven't heard yet from Yolen Mitchell, but looking at the time, I want to spend the last few minutes of the plenary um, listening to the organizing committee, and we will share Yolen's um, 
uh, plenary um, speech uh, to mo in tomorrow's uh, opening plenary. So let me go now. Uh, I see Subhendu Kumar has uh, his hand raised, so member of the organizing uh, committee. Uh, Subhendu, yes. How would you like to respond to these first two plenary uh, speeches? Uh, uh, hi, Purnodha Madam and hi, Reda. Uh, just my one question to Madam is that often I've seen in any introduction of vaccine, I give uh, due importance to the Madam's word regarding three Vs, the vaccine, the vaccine, the vaccinator. But when we launch a vaccine, we dedicated whatever time for the national or the state or the district level TOT. But when it's come to the ground level, we dedicated much less time. But where the I think the time needs to be give much more. That is the my first point of concern. And the second point of concern uh, is that uh, for once someone is recruited as a health worker and is supposed to work in the vaccination process. But uh, there is very little scope of refresher training. And from T2R, we uh, teach to teach uh, learning from peers. We learn that there is a very lacuna that the vaccinators needs refresher training. I think this needs to be uh, advocated to every country so that every country should uh, uh, at least plan every two to three years the refresher training. Over. Thank you, uh, Subhendu. Um, of course, um, you are here in a personal capacity, not representing the uh, World Health Organization, as, as I understand it, and you are as a volunteer of the organizing here as a member of the organizing committee. Just because you have the WHO logo in your ba background, I want to make sure that's clear. Now, uh, Rajat uh, Garg um, will be our next uh, speaker, and then we'll be looking. We we have. There are members of the organizing committee from 35 countries, uh, so we're eager to hear uh, many different voices before we wrap up. We have just four minutes for this plenary, and just to tell you what you're going to be doing next, uh, at the 45-minute mark, you will be going, you will see that the networking will light up. Um, and when you go into the networking, it's kind of neat. You just click and you connect with somebody else. You can then decide to stay connected afterwards if you'd like to. Uh, uh, you both have to agree to stay in touch. And then at the top of the hour, very, very important, we go into the sessions. So don't miss this. Don't go into the open sessions. Don't go into the country sessions yet. That will happen tomorrow. You will see the two sessions that are in the schedule appear at the top here. All right. Um, so now back to uh, Rajat uh, Garg. Over to you. Uh, Rajat, are you able to speak to us? Uh, thank you, Reda. It's always great to listen from the experts uh, like Dr. Anwada. Uh, my only question is that, uh, and I think it will be, uh, I think it will be a question for many, maybe a question from many of us. Like, like COVID-19 has created an unprecedented situation where there may be more than one type of COVID-19 vaccine, that is COVID-19 vaccine from different manufacturers, which the health workers may be using. So how to mitigate the training challenges? Because usually in the universal immunization program, uh, in one particular area, only one type of vaccine is used. So now this is an unprecedented situation in uh, during COVID where there may be vaccine from different manufacturers, which may be uh, administered in different ways. So how to mitigate the training challenges in relation to that? That was my only question. Mm -hmm. And thanks for the wonderful session and all the uh, knowledge that we got. And the whole organizing committee is delighted and excited to be a part of such a great uh, uh, conference. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much, uh, Rizat Gard, one of 282 members of the Teach to Reach Organizing Committee. Right now we have an incredible 712 people watching the plenary. Thank you uh, for trusting us, for joining this uh, conference. We hope it will be useful in a practical sense. As we know, 50 countries are already uh, working on the practical aspects of introducing COVID uh, vaccine. Now, as I say, at the 45 minute mark, you're all welcome to go uh, to the, uh, uh, to the uh, networking session. Don't go overboard on the networking. We saw some of that this morning. Um, it's These are three-minute sessions. You can decide, meet someone randomly. It could be a global partner. It could be someone from your country. It could be someone from halfway across the world. 
But what we want you to focus on is go to the reception if you haven't done so already and scroll down, scroll down until you get to the schedule. You can move this out of the way. So you see right now we're in the opening ceremony and orientation. Next is the remote coffee starting in just one minute. And then you have to make a decision which of the sessions you're going to attend. Now, the sessions, you will not be able to see them until five minutes before when you click on sessions. So if you go to sessions more than five minutes before, you have to refresh the sessions page. So you have a choice between building capacity for health strength, health system strengthening. That's with Katya Shemnionek from Gavi, the Vaccine Alliance. Next is uh, at the same time, actually, these are all starting at the top of the hour in 15 minutes. Immunization Agenda 2030. Uh, so you can discuss that with the COVAX co-lead from the World Health Organization, uh, Anne Lindstrand. And then uh, at the same time, you can also choose to go learn more about this new transformative learning approach that came out of the COVID-19 peer hub with uh, the Center for Change and Complexity in Learning and then uh, the uh, WHO data team, or at least Carolina uh, Danavaro and uh, Marta Gassik-Dobo from, uh, from that team. Then more instant remote coffee. And then once again at 5 p.m. Geneva, you get another set of sessions. And again, you have to make the choice. They show up five minutes before the sessions. So I think that is it uh, for this first uh, plenary. Uh, thank you for being so great in numbers. I see many, many, and uh, uh, many, many messages in the chat, in the stage, and on social media. So thank you for that. Um, remember, 15 minutes networking, and then go into the sessions. Uh, you have to choose which of the sessions you go to. Sessions happen here where you see the sessions. Right now you see, you do not see the sessions that are go going to appear at 55, at the 55 minute mark. You will not be able to see them uh, before that. That's it. Uh, thank you and uh, see you soon. If you're still watching the plenary and you're on the stage, please go to the networking or simply get ready for your session. The networking is kind of neat. So we do hope you'll enjoy that, but there's no longer any reason for you to stay on the stage. If you're watching us on social media, that is fine for the plenaries, but for the actual sessions, you'll need to come back to the, um, uh, to the conference uh, space to attend the sessions. Uh, that's it uh, for this plenary.